there's different categories of stressors. There's internal stimulus and there's an external stimulus. Externally, this is basically finance and romance. So, can anybody relate to that? Financial stress, romantic stress, right? All these things are really important. There's also stuff that we can't actually control. That would be pollution, that would be traffic, that would be job stress. I know nobody here has job stress. I know you don't. <laughs> right? So these are the things that we would consider on the outside. I don't know if you know this, but in the Charlotte-Mecklenburg area alone, every day we're breathing in 1,000 toxic chemicals, and those are only the ones that we're aware of. The water we drink, most of it's polluted, and most of our food is polluted. All that creates stress on us. Um, right now, especially since 2001, the financial markets have been increasingly unstable. I know people that have worked for many, many years and had 60 to 70 percent of their savings go down the tubes with this changing stock market. Worldwide, there's just so much stress going on, it's unbelievable. You know, if you look at all the people who live around the Gulf of Mexico and New Orleans and all that, they're all looking saying, oh my God, my business is going to shut down. I don't know how many Marriott hotels are on the ocean, but they're probably concerned because those beaches may now be permanently destroyed. So stress is a big thing. So external, external stresses are very important. Now internal stresses are also important. And those are the lifestyle choices. This is how we sleep, how we exercise. Do we exercise the right way? Do we exercise too much? Do we exercise not enough? Do we sleep too much? Do we not sleep enough? Can we even fall asleep? And when we're asleep, are we grinding our teeth and sort of thinking about all of the day as it goes on? Are we actually resting so that we wake up ready and ready to go and excited for life and, and all that stuff? The other thing that goes on, how many thoughts do you think we have in a day? Somebody tell me. A whole lot, that's true. How many? Quantify it for me. Tell me. Throw out a number. Take a guess. 100. What's that? I'm like 20 a minute. <laughs> okay, so do the math. That's the same time. It depends on it depends on how much it's a lot. Not math. It depends yeah, me neither. It depends on so I'll just I'll help. Okay. Don't stress enough. We we have on average between forty to eighty thousand thoughts per day. That's a lot, right? Now the study says that depending on how deep of a thinker someone is, I don't know what that means. It could be someone who's just completely obsessive and thinks about everything all the time. I don't know if that qualifies you as a deep thinker or not. But what I can tell you is that a study that was done showed that 80% of the average person's thoughts were negative. That they were actually not nice thoughts about ourselves. I bet for at least a few of you in this room, if you told me the things that you tell yourself, I would walk away from you. I wouldn't be your friend. Is that true? Can anybody relate to that? It'd be pretty hard. Right? And if I said it to you, you'd be like, who does this guy think he is? I said, hey, I just heard your thoughts. I'm telling you what you're telling you. So what we call that is stinking thinking. You get in this pattern of these patterns where it's all of a sudden, like, all these negative thoughts. We actually call them ants, automated negative thoughts. Now, the cool thing is that you completely change that. You can completely change that. It's a big process of understanding the external and internal factors of stress. Now, here's the thing. Stress was, is, is a word that actually doesn't really mean a lot. In fact, I think it's overused. But here's what the stress response started as. I'm a caveman. Carrie, my lovely friend and assistant, was the cave woman. We're living there, and all of a sudden, a saber-toothed tiger comes and is about to eat my food and kill me and her. I need a way to get out of there fast or kill the thing, right? Both of which require, <coughs> who's heard of the term fight or flight? That's where it comes from. I either need to fight the tiger or I need to run from the tiger. So what happens? Our body releases all these hormones and all this activity in the nervous system so we get a burst of energy. Your memory for a brief second kicks in and you're like, oh, I remember where I left that club, right? Uh, your immune system kicks in. Your, your pain, sensitivity to the pain drops so that basically now either when I'm running or fighting, I don't feel anything because it's a lot less important that I just sprain my ankle than if I'm going to get gobbled up by the saber-toothed tiger. So short term, it's an amazing strategy, right? If the building was on fire, I hope we all go into fight or flight and get out really quick and help everybody else to get out. And then at the end, we're like, oh my god, like, I'm 
you know, that's when fight or flight's useful. It's not useful five times a week with your husband. It's not useful that every time that your phone rings. It's not useful every time you get in your car. Because what happens is it actually long-term impairs our cognitive performance, meaning how we think, how our brain works, how we feel. Remember the ants? It suppresses things like our thyroid, which gives us energy, helps us maintain healthy weight balance. It throws our blood sugar, diabetes, off. It decreases bone density, osteoporosis. Higher blood pressure, there's the cardiovascular disease as we talked about. Lowered immunity has a lot to do with cancer. And increased abdominal fat which is meaning that once we get more stress, it becomes harder and harder to lose weight, even when you're dieting and exercising. So now we get into this problem where it's like, oh my God. So if you really draw back the four main killers, most of them can be traced back to stress. Most of them can, are helpful in understanding why it is that we, like when we were 10 years old, for the most part, we had a, a joy of living, a connection. You know, it didn't just roll off your back for most people. And then slowly over time, the dimmer switch comes on and we start to lose that zest. We start to lose that joy. We stop feeling good and we start just getting by. Fight or flight. Real picture, um, he's a bullfighter. So in this case, he's fighting and flighting. Now, more on the, what's the first thing that happens? Who here has ever had a stressful event here at their job? It's okay, it's okay. I know you all have. I know you all have. With our breathing, what's the first thing that happens to our breathing? Are you like, oh, yes, I can totally handle this situation. Hey, a person I don't want to hear from, how are you? No, right? What does our breathing do? It gets shallow. It gets a little faster. So our breathing speeds up. This absolutely affects our whole health, and we'll go over that in a minute. The liver is affected because your body says, oh my God, danger, fight or flight. In reality, it's just your boss calling on the phone. It's really not that big of a deal in the big picture, right? I mean, it may feel like it, but in truth, it's not. So our liver works overtime, and it rushes sugar into your blood so that you can have energy really quick. You ever eat a cupcake, and you feel like lots of energy really quick, and then you crash? Same thing. So our body has a way to do that. Our blood pressure increases, and our heart rate speeds up. Right? You feel nervous. You ever get caught off in traffic and you're like, you know, and then you're like, you might say something to yourself or to them, but it's that feeling, it's that thing. feeling of fight or flight. Actually, our digestive system begins to shut down because the brain says, you don't need to digest your food right now, you just need to survive. But in the big picture, you don't just need to survive. It's not the saber-toothed tiger, but we act as if it is. 90%, according to the Archives of Internal Medicine, which is the American Medical Association's, one of their main journals, that 90% of all digestive troubles are actually stress-related. And so we might have all these really funky names that we put on the diseases, but in fact, most of them are stress-related. So ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, all those things, gastritis, they're basically names that tell us that your bowels are irritated. Well, it's like, yeah, no kidding. I could have gone to the Exxon station. I could have said, my stomach hurts. Yeah, your bowels are irritated. Except that he doesn't get paid $200,000 a year to tell me that. Nor can he produce a drug, which then he can get me on for the rest of my life, to get rid of the symptoms without actually really getting rid of the cause. Does that make sense? You guys with me so far? So the effects of stress. Here's just some of the goodies that go along with stress. Excessive hair loss and baldness. Now, it looks like you shave, so we may be in good. You may be good. <laughs> okay, I bet, I bet at least 60% of you can relate to neck tightness, muscle tightness, back pain, headaches, just tension, right? <laughs> Digestive problems. I just mentioned these gastritis, stomach ulcers, irritable colon. Skin, acne, eczema, and psoriasis. Anybody here notice they break out more during periods of stress? Brain, insomnia, headaches, irritability, anxiety, and depression. One in five women in the United States right now are antidepressant medication. Some people really need to be on medication. The, most of the people who need to be on medication aren't, and a lot of